last part of the equilibrium lecture, Le Chatelier's principle. The principle itself is rather uh, simplistic in terms of what it tells you. Uh, the idea behind this principle is that when you have a reaction, if the reaction is at equilibrium, technically speaking, nothing happens in terms of you observing a change. But let's say that you were to introduce a change to that reaction that is at equilibrium, you will disrupt the equilibrium itself and then the reaction will proceed in such a way to re-attain equilibrium. And that's te technically speaking what the Chatelier's principle is all about. It looks at a change in your reaction in, and asks the question, how is the reaction going to proceed? Is it going to go to the product side or is it going to go to the reactant side in order to achieve equilibrium once more? And there's a few ways in which this can happen. You can actually add a disturbance or a stress to your reaction to change it from being at equilibrium to being at a non-equilibrium state. Right? So, yes, there we go. Obi-1. You know, we're, we're trying to keep balance with the force. In this case, balance with the equilibrium. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, the disturbances could either be in the form of removing or adding reactants or products from your reaction. That would change the amount, which will change the value of your expression from being different from K. Uh, you could also change the volume, the pressure, or temperature. And the volume and pressure specifically is in regards to gases. Uh, the temperature could apply to gases or AQ substances in just the same way, but those changes will affect the equilibrium. And so we're going to look at each one of those changes. So let's take a look at removal first. What happens when you remove something? All right, so looking at H2I2 turning into two HIs. We have the equilibrium expression HI squared over H2 times I2. If you were to remove reactants, what that would mean for this expression is that you're going to have a value that is even smaller than what should be in the equilibrium constant. So the value of the reactants will be less. And whenever you make the numbers in the denominator smaller, you make the overall fraction larger than it was before. So what this will tell you is that the value of Q upon removing reactants from an equilibrium uh, reaction would be such that the value of Q ends up being larger than that of K. And so what that will tell you is that removing reactants is going to cause the reaction to switch to the reactant side. And the same thing can be said if you remove products. If you remove products, then the numerator is going to be smaller compared to the equilibrium expression. So the value of Q is going to be smaller than the value of K. And because of that, this will shift to the product side. So notice what's happened here. Wherever you're removing something, that's exactly the side that the equilibrium shifts to, right? So you could shift to the product side if you remove products, or you could shift to the reactant side if you remove reactants. Um, in a similar fashion, you could look at, you know, increasing the amount of uh, either the reactant or product. So if you add more reactants, what ends up happening is that your denominator now is larger than it should have been. And if you increase the value of the denominator, the overall fraction becomes smaller. So now the value of Q is going to be smaller than the value of K. So this will be shifting to the product side. And notice the difference. For removal, we shift it to the side where the removal took place. But when you're adding something, you're going to shift to the opposite side of where the addition is taking place, right? So we're adding more reactants, we're shifting to the product side. And the same thing happens with the products. If you add more products, then your numerator becomes larger than it should have been. So the value of Q is going to end up being larger than the value of K. So that means that you will be shifting to the reactant side, right? And once again, wherever you add something, you shift to the opposite side in terms of the reaction. And this is just based on the on what's happening to the fraction, the equilibrium fraction. All right, now for the volume, I'm going to complicate the situation a little bit more, but you'll see that ultimately we're going to come up with a simplistic way of looking at it. All right, so here we have only gases as far as the things that make it into the equilibrium expression. Remember that liquids and solids don't actually get input into the equilibrium expression. So this is all gases. Um, Okay, so we have uh, a KC expression, you know, concentration of CO2 over concentration of CH4 over concentration of O2 square. Now, the concentrations can be thought of being moles per volume. 
right? So you have the moles of CO2 over the volume of the flask over the, con the, the moles of CH4 over the volume of the flask times the moles of O2 squared divided by the volume squared. So all together on the denominator, you end up with volume cubed. And the reason the volumes are not changing, and I'm not saying that this is the volume of CO2 or this is the volume of CH4, is because the concentration of the gas is determined by the volume of the entire flask they're in. And so if you're dealing with a bunch of gases, they're all going to be in the same container. They have to, otherwise they're not in contact with each other and there's no reaction happening. So the volume is the same. But what you can see right here is that the volumes don't cancel out fully. In fact, you end up with volume left over in the denominator, right? So you end up with volume square left over here. And so what happens is that if you remove, or excuse me, if you reduce the volume, what's going to happen in this particular setup is that the, the bottom fraction is going to become larger. And if the larger, excuse me, the bottom fraction becomes larger, the overall fraction, the big fraction is going to become smaller, right? So you're going to have the following thing. Um, so now the value of K is actually going to be greater than the value of QC. And I know that it looks a little bit convoluted right now, but what's happening is that reducing the volume is shifting the equilibrium in this case to the product side. And if you look carefully, you realize that the reactant had an overall number of three gases present, but the product side only has one gas present. And so you reducing the volume, what basically you ended up doing is shifting the equilibrium to the side that had the least amount of gases. And this is kind of the rule that you're going to go by. If you reduce the volume, simply move to the side that has the least amount of gases, right? And the opposite is also true. If you increase the volume, ultimately what you're going to find out is that increasing the volume makes the bottom denominator smaller. Making the bottom denominator smaller makes the overall value of the entire fraction larger. So the value of QC is now going to be greater than K, and you're going to be shifting to the reactant side, which, to put it a different way, increasing the volume means that you have more space available. So the reaction shifts in such a way to maximize the amount of molecules present in that increased volume. And that means that you're going to have to shift to the reactant side in this reaction because you have more gaseous molecules present on the reactant side than you do on the product. So reduce the volume, shift to the side with the least amount of gases. Increase the volume, shift to the side that has the most amount of gases. Okay, so that's the way this goes. Now, one situation that may be encountered, that you may actually um, see, is one that takes place with H2 plus I2 turning into two HIs. If you look carefully, you're going to realize that um, in terms of concentration, right, you have um, moles over volume for the first the expression on top you have it square for the expression on the bottom you have moles over volume times moles over volume so the volume ends up being square but now you have volume square on top over volume square on the bottom so they fully cancel out and over here you don't have volume anywhere no volume on top no volume on the bottom so changing the volume literally has no effect whatsoever on the equilibrium constant of this reaction. And the reason why is because you have the same amount of gases on the left side as you do on the right side. So if you want to look at it this way, yes, there's no change here. If you want to look at it this way, you can you know, set up a table that explains all of the results. If the value of delta n, which once again is sum of coefficients of products minus the sum of the coefficients of the reactants, if this value is greater than zero, this is telling you that you have more products. If you have more products, Increasing the volume will benefit shifting to the product side. Decreasing the volume will benefit going to the reactant side. On the other hand, if the value of delta n is less than zero, meaning that you have more reactants, increasing the volume will shift the equilibrium to the reactant side. Decreasing the volume will shift it to the product side. But if the value of delta n is zero, meaning that you have the same amount of products as reactants for the gases, um, you have no change whatsoever upon increasing or decreasing the volume. So this situation is a little bit harder just because it has extra parameters that need to be considered. Now pressure is actually very similar to volume. What you have to keep in mind is uh, Boyle's law. In particular, the fact that pressure is inversely related to volume, right? So if you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume and vice versa. If you decrease the pressure, uh, or excuse me, if you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume. So 
the same parameters that we observed before for uh, volume get utilized right here, right? So if you think about it in terms of volume, the pressure is simply the opposite effect. All right, so let me just fast forward because it's the same idea. Uh, increasing the volume is the same thing as the, uh, excuse me, increasing the pressure is the same thing as decreasing the volume. And decreasing the pressure is the same thing as increasing the volume. So if you just look at it from the point of view of volume, um, the situation is actually the same as just volume altogether. Increase the increase, or excuse me, if you have the value of delta N being greater than zero, that means that you have more products. So decreasing the volume will make it once you shift to the reactant side. And decreasing volume is the same thing as increasing pressure. If you have more products than reactants, increasing the volume will want to make you shift to the product side, but increasing the volume is the same thing as decreasing the pressure. So you could still use the same table as we had before for just the volume. Just remember that the pressure effect is the opposite as the volume effect, right? Volume, if it increases, you're actually decreasing the pressure. And if the volume is decreasing, excuse me, if the volume is increasing, you're decreasing the pressure. So opposite effect for both of them, but basically it's the same table. Now the last one is temperature. And we kind of had a little uh, encounter with this when we started talking about kinetics. Uh, but this also has an effect on the equilibrium because ultimately the temperature dictates whether you can move to the product side exclusively or if you're going to be able to move to the product side and reactant side to some extent. So increasing the temperature will allow you to, yes, increase the reaction going forward, but at one point you're going to also start increasing the amount of products moving back to the reactant side. And if you remember from our discussion during kinetics, I told you that if the reaction is endothermic, increasing the temperature will ultimately make it easier for the products to go back to the reactant side. And so you'll end up decreasing the amount of products and by default, you will end up decreasing the equilibrium concentration uh, of your products. So yes, so we talked about all of this. For endothermic reactions, uh, you actually wanted to increase the, the temperature because the highest activation energy here was the one going forward not the one going backwards. So you want to maximize the amount of reactants going to the product side, and you can only do that by increasing the temperature. So simply state it. If you think of it this way, this will make the process even easier. If you think of an exothermic reaction as one that is generating heat and treat the heat as if it were a product, uh, then technically your equilibrium expression looks hypothetically like this, right? You have CO2 gas times heat on the product side, right? So on top of the fraction divided by CH4, not CO, but CH4 and O2 on the bottom, right? So I'm kind of messed up the terms right here a little bit. If you increase the temperature, what's going to happen is that you're going to increase the numerator of this fraction. So your QC is going to be in ending up being larger than your Kc. And this will tell you that you will actually want to shift to the reactant side. Another way to look at it is that if you are increasing the temperature, you are increasing the amount of heat, which happens to be on the product side. Wherever you add extra things, you shift to the opposite side, in this case, the reactant side. If you decrease the temperature for your exothermic reaction, you are removing products, so you're going to shift to the product side, right? So that's how this gets affected. And if you have an endothermic reaction like calcium carbonate turning into calcium oxide and CO2, um, the expression here is going to be CO2 on the product side. The solids don't make into the expression. The heat will have to be on the reactant side. So increasing the temperature will increase the denominator, which makes your QC value smaller than K, meaning that this shifts to the product side. And another way to put it is that you're increasing the amount of reactants, so you move to the opposite side. Decreasing the temperature decreases the amount of reactants, so you move to the reactant side. So if you treat the heat as if it were a product or reactant, um, you're going to get the, the proper uh, relationship in terms of where the equilibrium shifts. Uh, simply stated, treat the heat as a product and reactant, and if the heat derives from an endothermic reaction, the heat has to be on the reactant side. If the heat derives from an exothermic reaction, the heat has to be on the product side. Changing the temperature, increments in temperature means that you're adding heat. Decreasing the temperature means that you're decreasing heat. So if you keep that in mind, this process is going to be no different than adding products or removing products or conversely, adding reactants or removing products in terms of the 
way in which you go thinking about it. All right, so here's the little table that summarizes all of that, right? So you're gonna have to know whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. One way to tell is by looking at the value of delta H. Delta H being positive means that this is endothermic. Delta H being negative means that this is exothermic. So the heat is on the product side for exothermic, heat is on the reactant side for endothermic. And then depending upon what you're doing to temperature, you're gonna be shifting to either the product or reactant side. All right, so that concludes all of the stuff that we need to discuss for equilibrium. The Chatterley's principle, as you may have guessed, is a qualitative way of approximating whether the reaction is gonna to shift to the reactant side or the product side. And that will be the extent of the reactions I ask you in relation to the Chatelier's principle. You just have to tell me whether the reaction shifts to the reactant side, product side, or if there is no change. Okay, so we'll end this lecture right here and we'll continue uh, on the next video with acids and bases, which is the next topic of um, this chemistry course.